Okay, moving into our last section. How does no thing create something? How does the nonlinear, non-physical construct physical linear? It is a koan, something to contemplate. And it's what we've been contemplating in my talk today, really. So we, we're not going to get totally rational answers, but using Seth's concept of high intellect, a superb blend of intellect and intuition, as Seth called it, in the unknown reality. This is the epistemology that scholars are beginning to allow for, and the integral model allows for us to include, and in fact demands that we include the inner senses. But we include communities of practice that are adequate, and that's a community effort. And that's what science is. It is not done singly. It is confirmed or falsified by a community of peers. And using inner senses, this has been done in the religious traditions in terms of meditation and enlightenment and so on. Bringing that to bear in a scientific world is very exciting to me. And I think the potential of the next 50 to 200 years. So we're pushing the rational mind towards transrational answers. And this is what the previous pointing out in exercises designed to do over time, to open us to our inner senses, altered states, transrational awareness. The final concept that I want to talk about today is Seth's early notion of primary and secondary construction. So we've talked about the idea construction manuscript, the space continuums. These are beginning to refine that idea, primary and secondary. But Seth cautions that there's many subdivisions and other types, and I have yet to plow through or, and organize all of it. I'm going to read a few quotes now to sort of point out what he means by this. This is from session 71. And again, I'm just blown away. This is before the first year of sessions is even done. This part of the map is being delivered. And we're still unpacking it 45 years later. I mean, that's the cool thing, you know, that now in time we're able to digest this and put it in other structures and make more sense out of it. Seth says, a primary construction is a psychic gestalt formed into matter by a consciousness of itself. Such a primary construction is an attempt to create in the world of matter a replica of the inner psychic construction of the whole self, which we'll call the entity or source self or inner ego, as I've referred to it. Such a primary construction allows consciousness to operate, manipulate, and be perceived in the world of matter. The physical construction of consciousness is never complete as far as fulfilling the inner purpose involved. That is, consciousness can never fully construct itself into matter, and to do so would indeed imprison such a consciousness so that it could not escape the transient nature of matter itself. Even a primary construction, therefore, is but a partial appearance of inner nature into matter. In terms of consciousness, as I'm using it here, may need some further explanation. He goes on to explain that later. Now, regarding secondary constructions, secondary physical constructions are those created by a consciousness of its conception of other consciousnesses. So we're getting into the collective quadrants here from data received through telepathy and other means, including the five physical senses. Consciousness, therefore, forms pri the primary construction about itself, not to protect itself from matter, but in order to become allied with matter. Consciousness obviously being diffused through the whole physical construction. It hovers about and within the construction, but is not imprisoned by the construction. The apparent imprisoning of consciousness within the primary construction is the result of ignorance, which is a classic Buddhist thought. We don't remember our true self. We're imprisoned before we're enlightened and remember our true self. And there's other reasons uh, that Seth cites here. So secondary constructions, being composed of atoms and molecules, contain generalized consciousness and innate capsule comprehension. And that's one of those inner senses. And it's a type of psychological boundary creating. They do not contain the unifying, integrating, organizing, personal direction of the whole self. OK, so that's just an introduction to the idea of primary and secondary constructions. I want to, if I can stretch your mind even further today, 
We're going to just sort of walk through then a developmental sequence now from the Big Bang. And this is, a, in a nutshell, a summary of Seth's before, well, in the beginning, the first five chapters of Dreams, Evolution, and Value Fulfillment. So there's an initiating consciousness, and I put that in capitalization to show that it's a structure within all that is that's involved with the creation of universes. And so we have what I just call physios, quantum fields, nebula, galaxies. I do not believe in the, that we poofed in fully formed. In the, that's creationism, and I believe that's a traditional and less evolved understanding of the physics and psychology and so on of reality creation. So the Big Bang happens, quantum fields, all that basic stuff, the physical stuff, the physicists deal with primarily are there. As the nebula form into galaxies and suns and solar systems and planets, gradually as those processes unfold over billions of years, bios emerges, sexual, asexual reproducing life forms with cellular systems. At least those are the ones we're familiar with on this planet. But that is a transcend yet include. Bios includes physios, but not the other way around. The third major form of this in Seth's story is self-reflexive awareness, the birth of the outer ego, the terrible feeling of separation from the unity consciousness of inner consciousness before waking up in a physical body and that startling sense of being out here and we do really die and we do really hurt and I can't just think it away. And then what will come next in terms of framework one, call that psychos, the shift in consciousness that's out there in all kinds of different forms. I don't know, we don't know. We're collectively moving towards that and down the road, is there a teleological omega point as posited by Teilhard de Chardin, the uh, Jesuit paleontologist and priest? There is a directionality clearly in framework one terms happening here from all the evidence we can gather thus far. The story may change tomorrow with another big breakthrough or insight. And I just wanted to mention also that this initiating consciousness, Seth called the sleepwalkers. There's a lot of information in the Elias forum about dreamwalkers and the essence of Rose, who you may meet on Saturday night, holds this aspect of dreamwalker. She may or may not talk about that, who knows? And Chris calls them dream ancestors. So in their storytelling of this before the beginning and in the beginning, these initiating consciousnesses have been cast into their storytelling. Value, fulfillment, and growth in framework one. I just have a couple more quotes to read. In fact, it's just one here. You say that grass grows from a seed, but the grass is not the seed. The material of the grass is not the material of the seed. From experience, you know that the seed will often precede grass. Doesn't it always? I don't, <laughs> I think it always does, but I'm not sure. In fact, with Seth, you know, anything can happen. As usual, this is putting things backwards, Seth says, the grass contains no particle of matter that is identical in the seed. Here you clearly see the difference between value fulfillment and what you call growth. In your physical field, framework one, value fulfillment consists of the development of the ability of the immaterial, no thing, to express itself within the physical field as some thing. Growth is the erroneous conception that begins with the distortive idea of continuous physical matter, durable in time. And as you know, instead, matter is the simultaneous expression of consciousness. Matter has little, really no durability in itself and is merely the instantaneous form taken by consciousness. And this quote is going between the left hand and right hand quadrants, the non-physical and the physical part. Grass is common. It is supposed to grow from seed. Yet again, no particle of matter is the same in grass or seed. And this is an interesting set of statements here. Seed does not grow into grass. Acorns do not grow into trees. Children do not grow into adults. And I've had people cite that as proof that these developmental stages that I'm talking about are invalid. And I think that's a, that is not true. So in all instances, continuing with the quote, 
No particle of matter is the same in the so-called grown version as the initial construction. Matter itself does not grow. I cannot make this too plain. I believe Seth here is emphasizing that matter is not causal. The right-hand quadrants, the materialist, reductionist, scientismist, modern worldview is not causal 100%. I, according to this integral theory, it does play a role and it's important. But Seth is emphasizing the left-hand quadrants in these quotes, I believe. Again, he says, there is absolutely no continuity in the matter that composes the seeds and the matter that composes the grass. What you have instead is the value fulfillment of consciousness behind matter as it expands and expresses itself in various forms. And this expansion and expression is part of the Sethian definition of development in framework one terms. So I believe there are develop valid developmental stages within the primary and secondary constructions. I believe that there are stage sequences inherent, innate, in the blueprints for reality that the dreamwalkers dream up in their creation of universes. But they're guidelines, they're tendencies, they're not fixed. For example, in our world, caterpillars don't grow into bananas, baby don't, babies don't grow into oak trees. Now, if they do in your reality, we do joke. I remember Norm Friedman sitting up here and saying, well, some people's chessboard is different. <laughs> and in their reality, this may be happening. And we do have to factor that in. We cannot just marginalize that and diminish that. There may be some amazing new insight coming out from that perception. So we have to account for that. So just to reinforce, there's a physical stage sequence. So all physical stages, which are something, are constructed by consciousness, which is no thing. These images, by the way, are by a surrealist painter named Jacek Yarkas. I have the name, uh, and you can get it from me afterwards. There's a YouTube video that has many of his paintings, and you can find them on the web. They're quite beautiful. All right, to wrap this up, and I'm going to go through this quickly because I did want to have some time for interaction and questions. So what? What's the point of all this? When we consider how various developmental sequences work together in systemic harmony, this quadrant integral notion, we get a more complete, balanced, and integral view. Einstein, there's a famous quote of his that says, the problems we face today cannot be solved by the level of thinking that created them, implying we need a wider awareness, a more evolved awareness. And these stage models support that notion. So these are in integral terms, just different ways in the left-hand side and right-hand side, internally and externally, that individuals and collectives develop through. Acknowledging these sequences means that some things in framework one terms are better and worse, wider and narrower, mature and immature, and dare I say healthy and unhealthy. Good and evil do exist in the traditional worldview systems. It is real out there. Look at our president in office and his evildoers. And look at the fundamentalists supporting the current Republican ticket. It is a reality, and it's something we have to be sensitive to and to work with and factor into our integral approach to things. This has evolved, though, in terms of modern and postmodern worldviews into the notion of health and pathology. That's really our version of good and evil, better and worse. So judging is not bad. We do it all the time. 
And this is contextual, okay? I really have to nuance this and subtly explain this, and I don't have time today, but I'm just putting that out there. So the point is to learn to use great care, concern, and compassion with whatever developmental stage models we go on to use for whatever purposes. Why? To avoid the horrors of Nazi Germany's social Darwinism, eugenics back in the teens and 20s of the last century, racial hygiene, human experimentation, sterilization, genocide, all result from the improper use of these developmental sequences. The intent is good, but the results have been horrific. And so this is the great danger that I believe faces the integral movement and will either solidify it into a useful movement or make it collapse and evolve into something else down the road. The Seth material emphasized the individual and as such it has yet to scale up into the collective in any significant way. For example, there are only three books dedicated to the collective and they came rather late, the, the last two posthumously. So really by the time these books came out and the Seth thing had hit and it was very big, the nature of personal reality, Seth speaks, I create my own reality, boomeritis, narcissism was rampant, off and running with that. And these never kind of got factored into, in my opinion and my experience in the Sethian community, in terms of the email list, and I have documentation for this, I'm not, there's anecdotal evidence in my email list that we can point to, and some of you are aware of this over the last 10 years that I've been doing this. So by taking an integral approach to the Seth material, I believe we can further mine its gems, help scale it into the collective dimensions of being, and help provide new solutions to the many challenges facing us today. Thank you very much. Okay, we only have five minutes, but if there's anything left in there for questions, yes. Just spell the name of the artist. Yes. J A C E K, capital Y E R K A S. And by the way, this presentation will be available on the New Worldview website, video, audio. I will have the quotes. I apologize for not having all those quotes there. I know it's hard to read through as I go through this, but I'm planting seeds. And if you go through them again, they'll be there. And also the tribute to uh, Rob last night. I will get a refined version of that also freely available on the website so you can download that and have that too after the conference. There's a question back here. Can someone get him a mic so we can record his question? Or come on up, because we're, we're running out of time. And it's lunchtime, and I'm sure you're all hungry and looking forward to a nice lunch. It's pressure, I forgot. Thanks, Ethan. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, I'm not, after all, I'm not sure it was uh, all that great a question, but um, I don't know if you saw, on, I think it was uh, in Salon.com, there was an interview with Ken Wilber, and he, well, he was critical of uh, Deepak Chopra and um, some of the things that you've been critical of, but I wondered whether, and I'm not sure whether you read the interview, but... Uh, I'm not sure I have. I'm, I've, I've read most of Ken's work, but, and uh, notes included. <laughs> um, but I think he is quite critical of Create Your Own Reality, and I'm wondering whether um, there are differences with... I, I know you're an yes. integralist, and in, yes. probably an Enneagram 4, but uh, <laughs> all about integrating, but uh, I'm wondering whether there are... Uh, significant differences between what Wilbur is about, which is, I mean, I'm not really that fam as familiar with Wilbur as you are, but um, my feeling is that there is a real different emphasis between Wilbur and Seth, and uh, in 30 seconds. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have an answer for that. Ken wrote a book that he published in 2002 called Boomeritis, and it's not his best writing, but there's some interesting ideas in it. and. Basically, he critiqued the notion of, it's a criticism of post-modernity, post-modern worldviews. And they're biting criticisms, and I think they're very accurate and need to be considered and factored into all of our work. So he criticized you create your own reality and channeling, and it kind of really upset me and shook me. So it took me a year to factor that in, and that was the source of an article that's in the New Worldview Library called, Who is the You in You Create Your Own Reality? And it's... I've just flirted with it in this talk today. But it's, and also, Ken has never read any of the Seth books. So in terms of this huge integral edifice that's all inclusive, 
we can situate and put in the Seth material and expand and unpack various parts of the Seth material and bring a lot of, I think, clarity to other areas. I don't agree with everything Ken says as a theorist. I don't expect you to agree with everything I say when I'm putting on my theorist hat. But we're still trying to probe and, and create a map that's useful. So the notion that you create reality, what Ken is, is criticizing is what I talked about today, that the outer ego is 100% causal. And it's not. Everything in the integral matrix is co-creating. And those four quadrants, he calls it tetramesh. These matter is creating, inner consciousness is creating. Seth needed to emphasize the interior thing, to, to punch away at the modern uh, worldview that, that's still very much in power. But it's, it's starting to show around the edges. John, did you have a, can we get him the microphone so it's on the, on the tape? Uh, what? On? No? When I interviewed Ken Wilber for my channeling book in 1986, uh, we, we were talking about not only channeling, but about uh, Seth and reality creation. And uh, he got very bitter. He got, he got angry at me, too, for, during that period, uh, or the uh, part of that telephone call, because uh, his, uh, the woman in his life, his Trey, love, yeah. was, Trey, was, yeah. was, was dying. Yes. And he just, he just was outraged. How yes. can you you trying to tell me that she's creating her own reality to, to take herself out of my life and herself out of her own life, and he was just bitter. His voice was all you know, cracking. I've got the recording of it. And then he kind of calmed back down and stuff, but it was, a, it was a, one of the bigger confrontations I had with don't give me that you create your own reality stuff. That's just too facile. Uh, life is more complex. We are. We deserve more than that. And then I, then I was flown down to uh, Texas by some people who were responding to The Secret, uh, and they had a, a Christian response to it. It's just too facile. It's too, it's too quick fix. It's just too uh, hedonistic, and it's coming only from that egoic level. And they wanted to say, shouldn't there be ethics involved with this? Shouldn't there be a moral side to you create your own reality in, in, the, in the secret sense? So again, it was kind of a reprise of, of, of Wilbur 20 years later. Yeah, and that was Wilbur 3. There's been five major stages of Wilbur's theory to date. And that was, so John's interaction is only from phase number three. Ken has evolved much of his thinking, and I would, I would love to be able to sit down with him uh, and discuss some of this. I've not had the opportunity to do that so far. Okay, other, oh, by the way, before I forget, I have five copies, oh, they're all gone, great, never mind, sorry. I, I, they were left over from my talk last month, I just want to give them, it's available on the website in the New Worldview Library in a PDF format. The five, it's an overview of Ken's theory. There's a lot of stuff there, and by the way, while I'm on this, we just added Google search to the New Worldview website. It's all in the Google data catalog anyway. I finally, if you can't beat them, join them and added it so you get the most thorough. It searches the PDF files, which doesn't mean anything to the non-technical, but that's a, that's a breakthrough in the last few years. So when you use the search engine on New Worldview now, you can use all those Google subtleties and you can mine the entire site and get a lot of stuff because it's such a big site and it's hard to plow through, I realize. So use that search engine, you're gonna find a lot more stuff. We have time for one last question. Frank, can we just get, get him on the microphone just to record it, please? You talked about primary and secondary creations. Could you elaborate a little more about secondary creations? This isn't the self, this is the, what I would say, the outer self creations. This is a distinction that Seth makes, right, between primary and secondary constructions. And again, he's, it, it's subtle, but the, the primary construction is what you've been interacting with all morning here, my body, my mind coming through. My perception of you just now, as we co-create collectively, is a secondary construction. And there is matter, atoms, molecules involved in that. So it's, and there's all different kinds of stuff, and we barely unpacked any of that stuff yet in the sciences that we have. So I think there's a, a long run ahead of us for the Seth material and the integral approach is again, just one way to mine those gems and come to some further conclusions. Thanks guys, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>